Welcome, and thank you all for joining us to learn about Pennsylvania today. Pennsylvania is called the Keystone State, and, and a keystone is that stone that sits atop of an archway that links and holds all of the other stones of the arch together. And Pennsylvania is known as the Keystone State because it sits in the middle of the original 13 colonies and seemingly linked all of them together. Uh, the nickname is apt for genealogists, since Pennsylvania is certainly a keystone for many uh, ancestral lines. Many immigrant ancestors passed through Philadelphia uh, before moving north, northward into western New York or westward into the Ohio Valley or southward into Virginia, North Carolina, and other southern states. So it was one of America's most important early crossroads. Thus, many Americans have Pennsylvania roots, even if their ancestors did not die in the state and only passed through it. In this talk, I want to give you an overview of the basic record groups and websites for doing genealogical research in Pennsylvania. I also want to suggest some research strategies for making the most of your experience. So before we get into the records, I thought I would give you a very brief overview of the history of Pennsylvania, its settlement and geography, since both have an impact uh, in some respects on our research. The earliest settlers in Pennsylvania were Swedes. Uh, who established settlements along the Delaware River between 1632 and 1643. Uh, these were located both in Pennsylvania and what is now Delaware, and the area was called New Sweden. The Dutch took control from the Swedes in 1655, and then the English, in their war with the Netherlands, took, uh, took control between 1664 and 1682. Um, we all know who William Penn was. Uh, in 1681, King Charles II granted William Penn a charter for the territory that would become Pennsylvania in order to settle a gambling debt that the king owed to Penn's father. Uh, William named it Pennsylvania or Penn's Woods, allegedly for his father, and he arrived with a group of 23 ships that sailed at the end of 1682. Because Penn was a Quaker, the new colony gained a reputation as a place for religious freedom and tolerance. Uh, because of this new freedom, Pennsylvania attracted a number of immigrant groups in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, the earliest, of course, were the descendants of the Swedes and the Dutch that had settled here already uh, in the 17th century. Uh, many Quakers then came from both England and Wales, uh, following Penn's lead as they arrived in the colony. Uh, the Welsh offered 40,000 acres in what is now Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery counties in what became known as the Welsh Tract. Uh, French Protestants, known as Huguenots, uh, arrived in the late 17th and early 18th centuries after being forced out of France. Germans from the Palatinate of the Rhine River area uh, began arriving in large numbers in the 18th century, around 1718 to be exact, uh, as did Mennonites and Anabaptists from Switzerland. Uh, there were also large numbers of Scottish and Scots-Irish settlers, many of them Presbyterian, who settled in the frontier areas, especially out in the west, like in Westmoreland County and those areas, Allegheny County. Finally, some English settlers who were non-Quakers also came. Penn's initial charter was only for the section of land that contained modern Philadelphia along the Delaware River in eastern Pennsylvania, the section that you see on the map marked 1682. Um, through a series of treaties with the Indians, Penn and his descendants greatly expanded the size of Pennsylvania. For example, in 1737, the so-called walking purchase uh, negotiated by Penn's sons from an earlier treaty, allowed them to claim land from the Lenape Indians as far as a man could walk in a day and a half. They hired their fastest runners to follow marked trails, allowing them to claim an area of 1.2 million acres. Um, more purchases followed in 1749, 1754, 1768, and 1784, as you can see on this map, allowing them to build up the colony into the size that we know of Pennsylvania today. That said, there were a lot of boundary disputes in the early years. Connecticut claimed a stretch of territory in the northern part of the state that was not settled, believe it or not, until 1786. Uh, Maryland claimed an extended northern border, including the, the city of Philadelphia for a time. And that line was settled in 1767 with the completion of the Mason-Dixon line survey, the traditional boundary between north and south. The lower counties of Newcastle, Kent, and Sussex that became had been administered by Pennsylvania, became formally part of the colony of Delaware in 1776. These counties were originally had different names, such as Deal, Fort Hill, New Amstel, and St. Jones counties. We don't know them by those names today, but they are historical county names. 
and they were renamed to their present names in the late uh, 17th century. Here's another boundary map. Um, Virginia also claimed land in the southwestern part of what is now Pennsylvania, an area known as Yohogania, uh, that was part of the district of West Augusta. This claim was not resolved until 1780 when the current boundary was established. It's important for us as genealogists to understand these disputes uh, because our ancestors who lived in these border areas may appear in the records of one state or another state. For example, if you have ancestors in the southwestern part of Pennsylvania in the 1760s and 1770s, and a lot of Scots-Irish uh, went out to that area, you will certainly want to look at Augusta County, Virginia, to see if they were part of Yohogania. Uh, if they lived in the northern part of Pennsylvania, they may well have lived in Connecticut prior to moving to Pennsylvania, and some early Delaware people also appear in, Pens in Philadelphia court records. So there's overlap because of these boundary disputes. You also have to take note of the roads um, and it has some understanding of the roads that pass through Pennsylvania since these routes uh, give us clues about the location of additional records. For example, the Great Wagon Road, also known as the Conestoga Road, which is seen in green, uh, began in Philadelphia, went its way through Lancaster and York counties, then it's turned southward through Hagerstown, Maryland, crossing the Potomac and going through Winchester, Virginia, through the Shenandoah Valley, including Harrisonburg, Stanton, and Lexington, until reaching Salisbury, Massachusetts. Uh, many Scots-Irish followed this road into the south before moving uh, into South Carolina and Georgia. Germans also followed this road into Virginia. So if you have Southern ancestors that passed along this road, you may wanna consider whether pertinent records exist along the towns that this road passed through. Uh, during the French and Indian War, the colony built two major roads into western Pennsylvania, the Forbes Road, which is shown in purple on this map, and Braddock's Road, which is so shown in yellow. Uh, and they took travelers to Fort Pitt and into the Ohio Valley. Eventually, the Forbes Road became part of the so-called National Road, uh, which is now I-70, which became a major uh, route for settlers moving into Ohio, uh, Indiana, and Illinois. So Pennsylvania was truly a crossroads, a place where many settlers passed through on their way to other places. Um, Philadelphia grew in importance, becoming the largest city in the 13 colonies. Industry followed its growth uh, with the construction of factories and mills. In the 19th century, Pennsylvania would become a major industrial site and attracted millions of immigrants from across Europe to work in the steel mills. Uh, the discovery of oil at Titusville in 1859 led to more settlement in the middle part of the state. There were special towns, like mid-sized towns like Bethlehem, uh, which grew up across Pennsylvania, which also spurred increased uh, immigration. Uh, by the time the steel mills were built in Pittsburgh and elsewhere, large numbers of immigrants poured through Philadelphia, New York, and Baltimore. They came from diverse places, um, more diverse places than the earlier group in the 18th century. They included Catholics from Ireland, as well as Asians from China, and Catholic and Protestant settlers from Germany and Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe. There were African Americans that came up from the South, uh, leaving their former homes, especially after the Civil War, and met to work in Northern factories. By 1900, Pennsylvania had become a diversified state with a wide range of ethnicities among its population, living in both urban and rural areas. I want to turn now to some of the different types of genealogical records that you can find in Pennsylvania, starting with vital records. Pennsylvania, unfortunately, was, was late uh, in recording births, marriages, and deaths compared to other states, much, much later than New England states. For this reason, it can be challenging to trace people back in colonial records here if you are accustomed to doing research in, in New England records. Um, William Penn, believe it or not, ordered uh, that vital but records be kept in Pennsylvania, marriages, uh, in 1682. Um, however, very few marriages were ever recorded at this time, and officials largely ignored the law, too bad. Uh, individual churches and Quaker meetings sometimes kept records, and we will look at those in a little while. But not until 1852 did the state mandate the keeping of birth and death records. But the law was abandoned only a few years later in 1855, and the records of only 49 counties survived. Uh, the Register of Wills Office uh, kept these records in most counties. Uh, in 1860, Philadelphia mandated the keeping of vital records, which was followed by Pittsburgh in 1870. 
but they represent only a, only a fraction of the total number of events uh, in those places, and many births and deaths went unrecorded. Chester, Fulton, and Cumberland counties began keeping some vital records about 1873. Uh, most other counties uh, attempted to keep records in 1893, but the state itself did not enter the picture until 1906 uh, with the creation of the State Department of Health and its Bureau of Vital Statistics. Not until 1915 were all vital records uniformly kept on a statewide basis, much later than many other states. This piecemeal approach to record keeping makes it a challenge to find vital records since uh, there are many gaps in the records in the 19th century and many people were never recorded. You have to get accustomed to finding alternative sources. If you have relatives that lived in Pennsylvania after 1906, the records improve greatly and you are much likely to have success in your, in your search. So um, there are 12 major databases of birth, marriage, and death records that have come online in recent years uh, through ancestry and family search. And, Collectively, they have made researching in, in Pennsylvania, especially uh, in the late 19th and 20th centuries, much, much easier than it was just a few years ago. All of these are listed on your handout, but I want to touch on them and show you some of the examples of vital records since they vary uh, according to time period. Ancestry.com has several major Pennsylvania databases with digitized records. Uh, Pennsylvania death certificates, 1906 to 1964, which has images of actual certificates. Uh, Pennsylvania birth records, 1906 to 1909, which has actual images, but for a small number of years. Uh, Philadelphia, uh, death certificates index, 1803 to 1915, only some records are digitized. Uh, the years are misleading, which is the reason uh, there's, an, there's an asterisk on here, because they really uh, are, most of them start in the 1850s. Uh, the Philadelphia marriage index, 1885 to 1951, is mostly abstracts. Uh, Philadelphia marriages, 1852 to 1968. Some images, some abstracts. Uh, more images are being loaded in, however. Uh, Pennsylvania births, 1852 to 1854, and deaths, 1852 to 54, are two separate databases on ancestry that show the earliest public vital records for the state, but they are only extant, remember, for 49 counties. Uh, both of these databases have images, however. Uh, family search. Uh, has a number of them as well on here. Um, Pennsylvania births and christenings, 1709 to 1950. Uh, don't be fooled by that date range. Most of the dates are from the 1800s. These are abstracts only. Uh, Pennsylvania civil marriages, 1677 to 1950. Again, don't be fooled by the date range. Most of the records are from the 19th and 20th centuries, but it does contain images. There are only uh, about 209,000 records in this database, unfortunately. Um, let's see. My page here. Philadelphia or Pennsylvania County marriages, 1885 to 1950. This is a major database with 2.2 million records of images with of original marriage licenses. Uh, some of the records go back before 1885. Uh, Pittsburgh city deaths, 1870 to 1905. These are city only death records uh, with images. Uh, Philadelphia city births, 1860 to 1906. Uh, this is a database with images. Um, and uh, as of last I checked, this database was restricted to um, libraries that had affiliate affiliations with LDS, with the LDS library. So you may not be able to get it from home. It might be worth checking on it again. So let's look at some of these things just to kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at here. Uh, this is from the uh, Philadelphia birth index, the sample um, uh, of the Philadelphia index of many births went unrecorded, as I say, but those that were recorded present, represent some of the earliest public vital records for the state, dating from the 1860s. Uh, we now have access to these images with this index as an LDS, since we're an LDS affiliate here. Whether you can get them at home now, whether they've changed that access, I don't know. Um, Another one is called Pennsylvania births, 1852 to 54. Uh, the earliest birth records actually date before, between 1850, uh, eight years before, between 1852 and 54, but they are extant for only 49 counties. Ancestry has separate databases for these births, complete with viewable images. Uh, these records were kept in printed registers with two births per page. In this record from 1852 in Bucks County, you can see at the top of the page, the name of the child, 
And then you see the birth date, the name of the father, the name of the mother with maiden name, the occupation of the father, the residence of the family, the name of the attending physician. It's a shame these records were not kept consistently uh, throughout uh, the 19th century because if they had been, it would have been a great source of information. Um, Ancestry's Pennsylvania Birth Records uh, Database 1906 to 1909 is a small database of digitized records uh, from the first time they were kept at the state level by the Bureau of Vital Statistics. Uh, they take a number of different forms, um, but they generally are in the form of birth certificates. Uh, they show the full names of the parents with the maiden name of the mother. It also lists the occupation of the father, which can be helpful. Uh, Pennsylvania Civil Marriage Records, 8, 1677 to 1950, uh, is another database uh, that's on Family Search. Um, it's, a, it's, as I say, a very small database. Uh, none of the records date from the 1600s, despite the, the title. They're all from the 19th or 20th centuries. Um, they're images of various county-level documents uh, using permissions to marry for underage parties, as we see on the example on the left. And Jacob Smith was giving permission for his son. Uh, William H. Smith to marry Millie Wagner um, in 1908. Uh, there are also more traditional licenses like we see uh, on the right, the Philadelphia example from 1872, which basically shows the name of the bride, the groom, and the date, and, and uh, the occupation of the groom, which is helpful. Uh, the Pennsylvania County marriages um, is 1885 to 1950 is a much larger database uh, of marriage licenses on family search. And as I said a moment ago, some of the records predate 1885. This example is from Philadelphia, dates from 1854, uh, a brief period between 1852 and 54 when vital records exist for some counties. Now, this is the best database to find those. Uh, these early records usually follow a marriage register format with the names of the parents, the birthplaces of the bride and groom, uh, their color, uh, the location of the marriage and the occupation of the groom. Here's another example of one, more of an abbreviated certificate. This one is from 1922. Doesn't give nearly as much information as the other ones. Uh, here's a later certificate. This one is from 1950. So you can see that they sort of get better through time. There are sometimes there are eras of periods of time where they're not as good as other eras, but certainly by the mid 20th century, they got to be pretty good. Um, and they, this certificate illustrates all the information that you'll see on here, the, the names of the parents of the bride and the groom, uh, date, um, occupations and so forth. Let's look at some death records. Death records vary greatly in style and content. As I mentioned, the earliest public death records along with birth records were, were recorded between 1852 and 1854 for only 49 counties. Like the births, they appeared in a two, in a two page printed form and were registered entirely at the county level. In this example from Cumberland County in 1852, the record gives the name of the deceased, the date of death, approximate age at death, uh, names of parents, occupation of father, cause of death, and the name of the attending physician. Uh, and again, it's a shame these weren't kept all through the 19th century. Here is a database of Pittsburgh city deaths. Pittsburgh and Philadelphia both had their own uh, vital record offices uh, that were apart from the rest of the state, and they kept vital records earlier than the rest of the state. Uh, they began in the 1860s to keep uh, records. This, this particular example is from Pittsburgh, from 1895, um, Pittsburgh used the same pre-printed forms that had been used earlier in the 1850s and recorded some of the same information. Um, Philadelphia's forms were slightly different and did not include the parents' names. Here's a much later death certificate. The, the biggest database uh, on ancestry uh, for Pennsylvania is the Pennsylvania Death Certificates, 1906 to 1964. This is a huge database with 22 million uh, actual death certificates, all in a format with which we are familiar. Um, they give the dates of birth of de and death of the, of the deceased, the cause of death, names of parents if known, and, and thus they can be a really important uh, source for 19th century birth record information since there may not be a birth record kept for some of these people. Uh, these records are fully searchable by name of deceased, by parent and spouse names, and by place and date. It's a huge and very important collection that has dramatically improved uh, Pennsylvania research for everybody. So let's move on from vital records and move into church records. Uh, because Pennsylvania records are so spotty and incomplete for the 19th century, 
and non-existent for the earlier period, uh, researchers need to find substitutes that can yield vital record information. Uh, many different religious groups formed congregations and kept records in Pennsylvania, many from the earliest period of their founding. Um, these records are probably the most important vital record substitute. Uh, many church records have been published and some have been digitized and are searchable online. Uh, many others are still unpublished and you may have to explore denominational archives or contact churches themselves in order to view the records. Excuse me for a minute. I wet my throat. Um, Pennsylvania was, from its founding, a haven for religious liberty, and thus many different denominations laid foundations in the state. The Quakers were among the first to arrive, and, and as followers of William Penn, and many Quaker meetings have been published that give birth, marriage, and death information about meeting members. <coughs> in the 18th century, uh, the Germans, the Swiss, and the Scots-Irish all settled in the state and all formed congregations. The Germans, many of whom arrived between 1708 and 1740, uh, formed Lutheran and Reformed congregations and kept records of baptism, marriages, and sometimes burials from a very early period. The Swiss, who arrived in the same period, formed both Reformed and Anabaptist and Mennonite congregations. The Reformed Church kept good records, the Mennonites and Amish less so, uh, because they were persecuted in their homeland and record keeping was not part of their religious tradition. The Dunkards, who are members of the Brethren Church, arrived in 1719 in Germantown, Pennsylvania, and they also kept membership records. The Moravians and the Schwenkfelders, which were both per persecuted groups in Germany, uh, also arrived in Pennsylvania. The Moravians founding Bethlehem and Nazareth in the 1740s, and the Schwenkfelders uh, came to Philadelphia in the 1730s. Uh, most of the Scots-Irish who arrived in the 18th century were Presbyterians, and their records are more spotty than those of the Germans. Fewer such records have been published, but many have been collected by the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia. Their records consist both of baptismal records, marriages, membership lists, and meeting minutes. But baptismal records are comparatively rare uh, when compared with marriage records. Thus, you are much more likely to find a marriage record of your 18th century Scots-Irish ancestor than you are a, a birth or a baptismal record. The Church of England, uh, later after 1789, the, the Episcopal Church uh, made inroads into Pennsylvania and kept excellent records, having come to Pennsylvania with English and some Irish settlers. Uh, one of the oldest congregations is Christ Church in Philadelphia, uh, whose records are digitized and online. Uh, later came Methodists and Baptists, whose numbers swelled uh, by the early 19th century. Their records consist mostly of meeting minutes. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church kept excellent records uh, and grew in size throughout the 19th century with the infusion of immigrants from Ireland, Germany, and Eastern Europe. There weren't very many Catholics in Pennsylvania before 1800. Um, there are a number of online church record databases, uh, and these are all should be on your uh, on your handout. Uh, they include references and sometimes images of actual records. Uh, Ancestry has put up quite a few of these in, in the last several years, many of them national in scope, and they include Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania congregations. Um, some specific to Pennsylvania include the Pennsylvania Church and Town Records, 1708 to 1985, which includes thousands of records and images, but the congregation is not always easily identified. So sometimes you have to scroll through the images to the front of the, of the digital film that they put on there uh, to see what the church is because it doesn't tell you. Um, many Episcopal church records are included in this database. Uh, there are also, uh, there's also Pennsylvania Lutheran baptisms and marriages and U.S. Evangelical Lutheran Church of America records, 1826 to 1940. These are two separate Lutheran databases with images. One strictly for Pennsylvania, the other in national in scope, which includes some Pennsylvania churches, and the two are not necessarily concurrent. So you've got to look at both of them. Uh, uh, so in other words, there are Pennsylvania records in both, in both that you need to look at. Ancestry has a database with images called, of Pennsylvania Methodist church records, as well as national databases of Dutch Reformed and Presbyterian church records with images. And these include many different Pennsylvania congregations. Family Search has two church databases devoted to Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania births and christenings and Pennsylvania church marriages. These are only databases without images. However, you most definitely want to go into the Family Search catalog 
and look for a specific church record for the area that your ancestor lived in. So if they're in Cumberland County, if they're living in Carlisle, you, and you want to know if there's a church record for them, go into the Family Search catalog, look under Cumberland County, uh, also look under the, the town where you think the church may have been, and, and see if there are any actual church records that they've digitized. They may not be indexed. You may have to scroll through them, but they may be on there. So uh, check for that. Uh, here's an example of a church record database. This is the Pennsylvania Church Marriages database from 1682 to 1976. Again, don't be fooled by those, those dates. Most of the marriages are from the, the 1700s. There's very few from the 1600s. Uh, this shows a marriage uh, at Christ Church in Philadelphia from 1731. Uh, there's no image attached to the record, uh, but it's still important to know that, there, that the marriage took place there because then you can track down the, the images in another source uh, and find them. So even if there's no image linked to it, uh, don't, be, don't be dissuaded by that. Uh, churches are virtually the only place we will find marriage records from 1700s to the early 1800s. Here's an example of a church record from a, a, an Episcopal church. This is St. James the Less Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. Uh, this is from the 1880s. Very, very standard kind of record you'll see for an Episcopal church. Um, and this one is contained in Ancestry's Pennsylvania Church and Town Records database. Uh, as they say, this data set is a mishmash of church records from different denominations. They're not always well labeled, which is my biggest criticism with it. Um, there are a number of published church records available out there. Um, many are, are countywide and have published uh, for counties throughout Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a good thing to check our catalog under the name of the county or the town and the keywords church records to see what might be available. Many of the older titles that are, that are out of copyright have been digitized and are available on Ancestry, on Family Search, and on Internet Archive. Uh, some of the major record sets uh, to be aware of is William Wade Hinshaw's uh, Encyclopedia of American Quaker Genealogy. It's, um, uh, volume two is devoted to Pennsylvania. Uh, contains abstracts of vital records from a number of different Quaker meetings. Uh, other Quaker meetings have been published privately or separately. I wouldn't consider Hinshaw to be comprehensive. So check the catalog under the meeting name if you know the meeting name. Uh, the late John T. Humphrey uh, has compiled a number of books gleaned uh, uh, from church records. He's taken birth records from church records for 15 counties. Uh, and, and most of them are from the eastern and southern part of Pennsylvania. Uh, Frederick Weiser, W-E-I-S-S-E-R, and Paul Miller Ruff, R-U-F-F, -F, have transcribed many Lutheran church records from Pennsylvania, uh, some of which are not available digitally, but they are available in book form. So and the Germans, as I say, were great at keeping birth records and baptismal records and marriage records. Uh, in, the, in the 1700s, they were probably the best group in, in the state that were keeping baptismal records. So if you've got an ancestor born uh, who has a German name that may have come from a German uh, congregation, there's a good chance you're gonna find uh, either a, a baptism or a confirmation record. So um, those, are, those sources are really useful. I broke through a while on one of my wife's lines this past uh, year that was a really hard line to track it, and uh, I did it through confirmation records in a church. So uh, it can be helpful. Uh, many other church records have been published or abstracted and are available in print or digitally. Here's an example of Paul Miller Ruff's books. Ruff has a lot of different uh, uh, books in print. This is his work for St. Paul's Lutheran and Reformed Church in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania. And as you can see here, he's transcribed uh, confirmations and communion records and baptismal records. This is a typical example of what you might find in his books. They're, they're sort of computer generated, but they're nicely done. He extracts the name of the child, the names of the parents. Sometimes you'll find both a birth date and a baptismal date. Sometimes you'll just find a baptismal date. It uh, gives the names of the parents and the names of the, of the godparents or the sponsors. That can be real important too because the sponsors um, will, might be clues of relatives and might be helpful in, in unraveling a larger family puzzle. Cemetery records are another great source for vital record information since gravestones um, show birth and death dates and cemetery records often contain uh, additional information about the deceased, especially Sexton's records that were kept at the cemetery office, uh, which were kept uh, often at the cemetery office or at the county level, especially if the cemetery was large enough to have its own office. Um, records in, of Pennsylvania cemeteries are available in book form. Uh, as well as on such databases as Find a Grave and Billion Graves. 
Uh, the latter websites have millions of gravestone inscriptions and can be searched by state and by county as well as by name. Hundreds of Pennsylvania cemeteries are included. Uh, to search for published cemetery books and sections records, check the library catalog under the county name and the world cemeteries. Uh, sometimes a, a gravestone will be transcribed incorrectly or the information on family search about the family will be inaccurate. I had an example a couple of years ago, I was working on a Pennsylvania family, went to find a grave and, the, and the, date, the dates were wrong because the gravestones were so eroded that the persons reviewing it couldn't even read the dates. And so the, there was wrong information on it. But fortunately, we had the Sexton's records here and the Sexton's records gave the accurate dates of birth and death for the person. And I was able to get an accurate uh, uh, information that I didn't get off of find a grave. So you have to be careful with find a grave. Um, and find a grave is much more valuable if there's an image of the stone with it. If there's no image of a stone with it, you have to take it very, very cautiously. But if there's an, a photographic image of the of the gravestone that's being abstracted, that in itself becomes then proof, and you can cite that in your footnote that you that there's a digital image with with a, uh, the the um, find a grave citation. Okay, so let's move off from, from vital records. Let's move into some other types of records that we have. Um, I want to turn uh, to tax records, um, which are as a really underutilized source by genealogists. Uh, tax records are an important substitute for the census, and they can help us identify people in the years before the 1790 census, as well as in the years between the federal enumerations. They can sometimes uh, provide detailed information about land and livestock holdings, uh, that will enrich our understanding of our ancestors' lives. Uh, Pennsylvania has some of the best tax records of any state. Uh, many lists are digitized and are fully searchable, making them great genealogical tools uh, for studying individuals and families in specific counties and specific years, especially in the 1700s. Um, it can be a challenging time when you may have more than one person of the same name living in the same place and knowing uh, where they are in tax records can sometimes uh, give you the clue that you need to separ separate one from the other. Uh, a couple of specific tax record sources are worth mentioning. Uh, the 1798 U.S. direct tax was a national property tax that was instituted in 1798, but most of the returns for the country are lost, except for those of Pennsylvania, which are largely intact. Um, these lists are fully indexed and digitized on Ancestry. Ancestry also offers a couple of other large tax collections. There's one called Pennsylvania Tax and Exoneration, 1768 to 1801, which is a major collection with images of Revolutionary War era tax lists. And also one called Pennsylvania Comp uh, Compiled Census and Sem Census Substitutes Index, which also has many tax lists included. Uh, there are also published tax lists for various counties in book form some for years that are not otherwise digitized or indexed. So check the library catalog under the name of the county and the word tax. Finally, there is the Pennsylvania Archives series in book form and online uh, at Fold 3. This is a collection uh, that has tax records and military rosters, and we will be exploring more of that in a minute when we get into military. I want to show you some examples of these just so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, this is a section of the 1798 U.S. direct tax for Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. And you can see it gives quite a bit of information about the landowner, it tells the dimension of his dwelling house and the outbuildings in feet, uh, gives the names and locations of, of neighboring pri proprietors, so the neighbors, that can be helpful, uh, the number of acres owned and the, and the amount of the, the valuation. Uh, we can get a we can uh, we get about as clear of a picture as we can of the land, the farmhouse and the farm buildings that may have been on the land. And if your ancestor was a renter, it might be that he was living as a renter, living uh, under some other uh, proprietor or property owner. Uh, here's a 1789 tax list for Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. Um, this one has two of my ancestors on it. I wanna show you the, the example here. Uh, Hans Ferguson was my uh, fifth great grandfather and his son, William, was my fourth great grandfather. And you'll notice on this, this list that it doesn't give a lot of information, but it shows that Hans has three horses and three cows and he's being taxed on 125, uh, he's paying 125 uh, pounds probably or being assessed at that rate uh, on, on land that's 250 acres, which you'll see on the, on the far left column. Below him is his son, William. He doesn't have any land at all and he's being assessed only 18, uh, which is I think an 18 shillings or something. 
So you can see that one is far more wealthy than the other, and you can get sometimes clues here uh, of a father and a son uh, just from the tax list. Even if there isn't a, a, another kind of record that links the two of them, the tax list gives you clues. Even at the top of the page, there's James Elliot and William Elliot there, and James is probably the father of William because James has 200 acres and William doesn't have any land. Uh, he's a, obviously a younger, may be a younger man that, that hasn't yet uh, amassed any land and is under his own name, so, but, but he's still on the tax list because he has livestock, so he gets taxed. So this can be helpful for, for uh, uncovering other um, people in the area that may be connected to you people. Um, I want to talk next about land records in Pennsylvania because the process of obtaining land grants there was more complicated than in any other state especially in the colonial and early national period. The process generated a lot of records, but it can be uh, dizzying and complicated to follow this pattern. So in the colonial period, when Pennsylvania was still under the proprietorship of the Penn family, if you wanted to buy a piece of land in a newly settled area that hadn't yet been surveyed, you had to go through a variety of steps. First, you had to submit a petition called an application requesting that a particular piece of land be surveyed. Pennsylvania used a system of meets and bounds to survey the land as well. It was very imprecise, like they would go and have chains and they would go up to a particular tree and then move to another tree, maybe a stone or maybe a creek. They didn't have uh, coordinates like we think of today. They used uh, the meets and bounds system. After you filed the application, the proprietors would issue a warrant, which is a written order to undertake the survey of the land requested in the application. The actual survey then followed, complete with a drawing or diagram of the parcel of land with exact measurements and the parcel uh, of adjoining landowners. Sometimes they would write the warrant information on the application. After the survey came the return of the survey, which contained a description of the surveyed land. Finally, the proprietors or the state issued a patent for the surveyed land, sometimes issued years after the fact and sometimes some to someone different than the person who made the initial application. So all of these steps in this process from application, warrant, survey, warrant, or return of survey, patent and deed uh, generated records. Um, these appear in deed books and of the types, uh, there, there's other kinds of records that can be appear in various sources. There can be appear in different land uh, documents. Um, apart from these are deed records, which are uh, records where two private individuals sold land to each other. Uh, land that had already been surveyed and patented, and these would appear in deed books uh, that we're familiar with, similar to what we would find in a, in, uh, in a county uh, courthouse. So there are two major databases for Pennsylvania land record documents, and you need to use them both in order to assemble a complete picture of the entire land grant transaction. Uh, Ancestry has Pennsylvania land warrants and applications, 1733 to 1952 which contains digital copies of original applications and warrants. The other database is the land records section of the uh, Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission website, which contains actual surveys of the land and patent information. You need to use both of those websites together. I also wanna to just touch on something uh, at the very bottom, you'll see something called the Susquehanna Company papers. There was a time period between 1750 and 1803 that Connecticut claimed land in Pennsylvania. Remember I showed you those maps where Pennsylvania and, and Connecticut had disputes and boundaries? Well, Connecticut uh, claimed that they owned uh, the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, especially the area around Luzerne County and Wilkes-Barre. And so you'll find grants uh, in these records, these Susquehanna Company papers of Connecticut settlers who came to Pennsylvania uh, in this time period. And uh, they're all these records are published along with other correspondence and records uh, in this really nice 11 volume set called the Susquehanna Company Papers. Just want you maybe be aware of that. If you have ancestors who maybe originated in Connecticut, they went to Pennsylvania, this is sort of why they may have moved from Connecticut to Pennsylvania is this, is this boundary dispute area. So let's walk through a, a record example of a land grant. Um, uh, this is one from my fourth great grandfather that I researched a few years ago. And we're going to look first at Ancestry's uh, Pennsylvania land warrants uh, and applications database. Uh, and we'll look at do a search under his name. So this is the Pennsylvania um, land warrants and, and applications database. It covers a wide period of time. You can search under a name, type in a name and in into this. And then you will get 
uh, you can get actual, um, you'll get an abstract and you'll get the actual record, the actual document. I apologize this isn't more clear, but uh, I'm gonna walk through this example because I have all the documents that, that go with this. So it says that William Eager makes an application for 110 acres in Westmoreland County, Mount Pleasant Township adjoining the lands of William Graham, the proprietary manor and Margaret Robinson, including an improvement. Westmoreland County, December 1782. That's what it says on there. Uh, the warrant was signed on the same paper, and you can see that in the second paragraph, we, the undernamed justices of the peace and common pleas court of Ditto, do certify from information that the above described tract of land was improved in the year 1782 in the month of December. Hugh Martin and Christian Frisbee. So they assigned it saying that the land had been improved, which means that that gave William some claim to the land. Then you want to see the actual uh, land grant and the survey. So you have to go then to the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission website. Uh, and it's a very difficult process to look through this site. Unfortunately, it's not an easy process, but we're going to walk through the steps. Um, I wish they made it more easy to search. Uh, but you, it simply isn't the case. It's just a complicated website to use. So bear with me as I go through this. First thing you want to do is find out when the land was purchased. So in, in William's case, it was 1782. So we want to go to the 1781 to 1809 um, uh, section. And we're going to be looking for his 1782 survey. So that's the section we want to click on. Next, we're going to go to the images of each database page. So uh, we want to look at the scanned warrant register pages, and uh, we'll want to we'll want to click on the images of each index page for each county. We know that the, the land grant was in Westmoreland County, so we'll want to scroll down on our page, and we'll keep scrolling down until we get down to Westmoreland County. And we want to click on that. Once we are in the county that we want, uh, we want to find the links to the specific pages under the letters of the alphabet. Since we're looking for eager. We want to go to the pages for pages 39, 40, 41, and 42, because those are the ones that cover the letter E. We don't know which of those will have the name that we want, but since EA uh, is for eager, will probably be in the front. We're going to click on page 39, uh, and if not there, we'll look at page 40. Turns out the grant we want is on page 40, and, uh, and it says William Eager, 160 acres with a warrant dated December 1786. Recall that the application was dated 1782. So it took a few years for the officials to proceed with their warrant of the survey. At the right of the page, you will see a column marked where survey is copied. And we want to make a note of the book and the page number of that book to go to the actual survey. So in this case, William Eager, he was the survey is in C book C65, page 48. Then we got to go to another page. Um, and this is um, We'll, we navigate a web part, the website called Images of Each Survey. It's not easy to find on the site. We want to go to the column marked C1 to C234, since um, uh, we're looking for book C65. We're going to go scrolling down, scrolling down until we get to C65. And then we're going to look for the page number that we wanted, which is page number 48. And uh, then we're going to click on that link. And that will take us, finally, after all this work, to the actual survey. Of, of William's land. You can see here what the land grant looked like of William Eager of his 165 acres. And you can you also see the people that had surrounding land to that, to that land grant. So you can see that the heirs of Joseph Eager were next door. That's kind of interesting because that turns out Joseph is William's father. Uh, we also see the return to the survey below seeking the warrant dated August 26, 1786. And the, the land was located on the waters of the Sewickley in Mount Pleasant Township, Westmoreland County containing 168 acres and allowance for 6% for roads. So it kind of is a, a useful document in a number of ways for all the different people that we see on here. On the reverse side, there's more information about the date of the patent. And the patent was dated March 17, 1789. Uh, many patents took even longer to be issued. So it's just the process of finding a land grant uh, in, in Pennsylvania as all these different steps. So let's move on to wills since we're running out of time here. Um, let's look at some of the other types of records available. And, and you know, the wills and probate records are very important. These are especially important for Pennsylvania since vital records were kept so late. So when researching a will or probate, we wanna do all we can to find the original will or estate settlement. If someone died without a will, uh, then there's a, an estate settlement or probate record. 
Originals are kept at the county level in one of two court offices. Wills are housed in the register of wills, which the orphans court, uh, while, the, while the orphans court handled probate matter, matters, real estate divisions, and the care of minor children. In some counties, all of the older records have been archived, but in other places, they may all be kept in a single office. If you are doing on-site research, it would pay to know in advance before you visit how the records are arranged and in what retrieval time is expected to get access to a particular record. Uh, but a lot of them are on family search um, and, and digitized now, so that's a great uh, assistance now to, to find information. Uh, they say many have been digitized on family search, so you want to go to Pennsylvania's uh, catalog uh, on, or to the family search catalog, look under the county in Pennsylvania and see if there are what they have under wills and probates. You can also go on Ancestry's Pennsylvania Wills and Probate Records database, 1683 to 1993 database. This is something they've published in conjunction with family search. They've worked together uh, and they put the images on their database and sometimes they're better indexed on here. So it's good to use the Ancestry index as well as the family search index together. Um, uh, so you want to make use, uh, you also want to look at published sources of, of, of wills too, and we'll show you those examples. You want to make use of both the published and the digital records when you're doing searches because the digitized will books will take you to the, to the actual will and the actual handwritten document, but the, dig, but the abstracted or published records may show other information that you can't get on, a, on just a regular index. So um, you want to look at both. Published abstracts are great for in referencing incidental names like witnesses, and you can't search for witnesses if you're on the, um, uh, the, the databases. So here's a search page for the Ancestry's Pennsylvania Wills and Probate Records, which has a very large collection of, of Pennsylvania will books. It's a great place to look for a will, but it will generally not have intestate or probate records. Um, here's an example of a digitized will from Cumberland County, Pennsylvania for one of my eager relatives. Uh, this is uh, the sort of record you will find digitized in this database. It is nice to be able to read the original will in the book. Um, it's actually not the, the original will. It's just a copy of the will that was written in the will book. The original will may not survive at all, but at least we have a, an early, early copy of it. Um, we get the language of the will and as close to the original document as we can, um, since the, the original may not have survived. So that's the original. Now you want to look at an abstract, and there are abstract books that the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania did uh, in the 1980s for a number of different counties, Cumberland, Bedford, Lancaster, Chester, Bucks, York, Montgomery, and several others. Uh, they are handwritten, but they are fully indexed for witnesses and all of their names. Uh, and that can be really important if we're doing research. Um, so here we have the same will looked at just on the previous screen, but now we can see it with, with the abstracted names. Um, I want to turn out of military records. Pennsylvania had no official military in the colonial era and under the Penn family proprietorship. A voluntary group organized themselves during the French and Indian War of the 1750s and 1760s. The first formally organized militia did not form until 1777 during the Revolutionary War. And at that time, the state instituted a draft of all men aged between 18 and 53 to serve two month terms in the state militia organized at the state, at the county level, excuse me. Uh, it continued until 1861. During the revolution, it also required all men to take an oath of allegiance, but not all records survive and not all men appear to have done so. Uh, from this period forward, Pennsylvania men served in both state and federal army units. Uh, you will find these records in published works online and in archives. We don't have time to go into all of them, but I wanna mention a couple of them that are important. Um, the published Pennsylvania archives available in book form and online through Fold 3 uh, contains published state militia lists from 1777. So if your ancestor lived in the state at that time and was at least 18, there's a very good chance that he's gonna appear on the list. Uh, if, if they lived there later, I wanna mention also um, Samuel P. Bates' multi-volume History of Pennsylvania Volunteers, which is a, a listing of all Pennsylvania Civil War soldiers. Uh, by regiment and company. So these are both two really good databases that are available in published form. Here's what the, the Fold 3 uh, search page looks like. You can plug in a name, uh, plug in a keyword, uh, and you can, you can limit it to specifically the Pennsylvania Archive series. 
uh, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to type in my ancestor, Hans Ferguson, and I'm going to come up with a number of search results here for Hans Ferguson. And I'm at the Pennsylvania Archives here where the red arrow is. I click on that, and then it takes me to a, a page where his name is listed on a, a muster roll for a particular battalion that was mustered into service in 1777. So he served only two months. Uh, I don't know if he saw any action, but there he is um, on, a, on a list. You can use that uh, list for if you're trying to get into this, um, the DAR or the SAR because that, that's proof of military service. Um, so it can be very helpful to have that. Uh, in the War of 1812, there are similar records that are on, uh, on fold three. In this case, uh, a different Hans, a younger one, uh, served in Captain Cochran's militia in a civil, as a civil contractor. Uh, he attempted to obtain a, to obtain a War of 1812 pension but it was rejected because of his civilian status. He was never formally in the army. So his pension file, which is fully digitized, gives his application and the government letter of rejection saying um, uh, that you are sorry, folks, you, you can't get in, uh, you can't get a pension. Not all of the War of 1812 pensions are digitized, but many of them are, and more of them are, are going up all the time. Um, in World War II, Ancestry has published a number of military databases for Pennsylvania, including one called uh, World War II honorably discharged veterans uh, who received bonus compensation from the state. This is a great database that only exists, to my knowledge, for Pennsylvania. Uh, the files show the name of the veteran, the date and place of birth, the service dates, the serial numbers, the names and addresses of beneficiaries, and the amount of the compensation. Since many of the original World War II law records were lost in a fire in, at the St. Louis uh, um, National Personnel Records Center, then this can be a really useful substitute for that. There's a similar set of files for the Pennsylvania Spanish-American War. Finally, I want to touch on printed sources. There are many printed and published genealogical sources for Pennsylvania, which should be not be overlooked. Uh, many that are out of copyright have been digitized online and uh, are available on Internet Archive or Family Search. But many books are still in copyright and not online, so you have to look physically at the book. Use our online catalog to search specifically for counties of interest. Such books may include city and county histories, land ownership atlases, township, uh, family genealogies about uh, Pennsylvania families, passenger lists, court records, land and will records, and so forth, directories and other records. And finally, there are a large number of genealogical and public historical periodicals that have been published for Pennsylvania. So let's look at an example. I mean, county history books are particularly important for family information. Um, many contain rosters of local elected officials as well as biographical sketches with genealogical information, often information that can't be found in other sources. So I would suggest beginning with Google, uh, losing Google uh, to, to search for a specific Pennsylvania ancestor name, put their name in quotes and type in the county name after the quotes and you might find some reference in a county history that's been digitized uh, for your ancestor. Uh, you should also explore our physical book collection that's on the shelf because there may be things that I say in books that are not yet digitized. County atlases are also worth exploring, even if they date from a later period than your ancestors lived. Uh, they too may contain biographical sketches, drawings, land ownership maps, all of which can provide important clues. City directories, we have a very large city directory collection here, as you may or may not know. Uh, and many of those are for Pennsylvania cities. Uh, most of the pre-1960 directories uh, here anyway are available on microfilm and microfiche, while most of the post-1960 titles are in book form. Uh, Philadelphia has some of the earliest uh, directories of any city in the United States and date back to the late 18th century. There are a number of published genealogies out there for Pennsylvania families. Um, uh, we have a large collection. We have more than uh, 65,000 published family histories and genealogies here. Uh, many of them pertain to Pennsylvania. So check our, our online catalog under the last name uh, to see what we might have. Uh, uh, that may or may not be evident from the, from the title whether the family had a Pennsylvania connection. You may have to actually look at the book. Um, there's another book that was done many years ago by Donald Verdon called Pennsylvania Genealogies and Family Histories. I think it was done in the 1980s. Um, and it contains a bibliography of many of the older genealogies of Pennsylvania families. Um, and we have also a particularly strong collection of Mennonite and Pennsylvania German genealogies here. So that's just something to be aware of. 
Uh, the Pennsylvania Genealogical Magazine is the quarterly to look at for Pennsylvania. Uh, it has a lot of very important genealogical information in it, uh, published through journal articles and not available online or in book form. Um, this has been published since 1948. Uh, another good one is called the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography. It's now become more of a scholarly journal with historical articles in it, but at one time in the past, it, can, it published a lot more genealogical information. And so it might be useful to look through that as well. These should all both be indexed uh, on the, uh, on, uh, on, online on PERCY, which we'll talk about here in a minute. This is the Periodical Source Index, or PERCY, uh, which is available right now on, inter, uh, inter, excuse me, on Find My Past. It's about ready to move from there to a uh, platform uh, on our own website, but we haven't established exactly what that's gonna look like yet. Um, but this is a great tool for looking uh, at buried information in articles that have appeared in journals. So if there was an article about a particular record group in a particular county, you could search under the county name or you could search under the particular family name and find information of what you're looking for. Um, there are a number of good uh, libraries and archives um, in Pennsylvania to do research. Um, the National Archives has the Mid-Atlantic Region branch uh, in Philadelphia, uh, which has a lot of information in it uh, um, that's helpful. Lots of federal court records and things like that. The Historical Pencil Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia has a lot of manuscript records. The State Library of Pennsylvania in Harrisburg uh, and the Pennsylvania State Archives are both phenomenal collections for records of Pennsylvania. Uh, the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh has a lot of records pertaining to Allegheny County and the western part of Pennsylvania. The Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia, as I mentioned before, uh, collects the actual church registers of many, many uh, active and defunct uh, Presbyterian churches all over the country. And they do have a research service, and they will, they will search, under, search the church record for you for a fee. Uh, so it's a really useful collection. Um, there's a Friends Historical Society uh, Library in, um, in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, at Swarthmore College. There's the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh, which has a lot of information about that area, and many smaller regional and denominational collections just all across Pennsylvania. So just to conclude, um, I encourage you to take advantage of all of the available resources for uh, searching ancestors in the Keystone State. Uh, Pennsylvania can be a, a a very challenging uh, state, um, more so than some, especially the further back you go. Um, you may have to visit in person to explore all of its records, but hopefully you will find the experience a rewarding one. So thank you.